for the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image, not the actual thing, it can never with those same sacrifices, the old covenant stipulations, which they do every year, make those who would come perfect. It couldn't. Why? Because they just sinned the next time. Sin would still remain. Two, for then they wouldn't, for then if it did, they would have ceased to have been offered. For the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. If that sin sacrifice, old covenant, if going saying, I'm so sorry, Lord, I'm so sorry, repent, and then turn into if that actually cleared your conscience, it would be good enough. But it doesn't, right? Because next time you're like, I'm so sorry, Lord, I'm going to repent again. Change, right? But you're not following stipulations in order to remain in that righteousness. Change, grow, stop doing bad, start doing good, right? Into repentance and that definition, yeah. But this, people connect this idea of sacrifices and penance with a repentance of a physical nature or a verbal nature. And it's not. Because if it actually worked on you, this new covenant thing Jesus did, the consciousness of it wouldn't be there. You'd say, well, does that, what if I sin tomorrow? I'm conscious of it. No, it's the, the idea, the very consciousness, the understanding, this thought that sin, you're supposed to just live and think about sin all the time for not doing it or that it affects your relationship with God. You weren't born that way. Adam and Eve weren't made to be thinking sin, sin, sin all the time. Sin, sin, sin. No. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's intense. It's wild. And, and the, only with this old covenant understanding, and these verses say the exact opposite. Like, look at how clear this is. But because people read this and they still just think, oh, well, okay, it's just the blood. There's still the blood thingy. It's like, no, there's not the blood thingy anymore. But in those sacrifices, three, paying for it yourself, doing the stuff, there's a reminder of sins every year. Every year the sins, every year. Four, for it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away the sin. It couldn't do it. It wasn't supposed to. Now again, we look here. We're, this is not saying this idea of Jesus' blood washes sins now. And the goats ones only covered it back then. That is a part of this. But remember, the idea is, is that this is part of the old covenant versus the new, where when what Jesus did, the metaphorical idea of blood for a thing is now once and for all, not once in a while or not just after you sin or not here and there, but forever. Verse five, therefore, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you didn't desire, but a body you've prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously saying, Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you didn't desire nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. But then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. By that will, we've been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now look at the last line in these big things is his point. When Jesus was saying, I've come to do your will, O God, as he's quoting these Old Testament verses here, um, when he's saying that Jesus said that, when, and in the old verse where it's saying that God didn't want all those sacrifices, he didn't, he didn't care, you know, it wasn't about that. But he's saying, you didn't want all that stuff, I had pleasure, but I want to do your will. That's what a pleasure is. So it says that in Jesus's will of wanting to do what God really wanted, that we have been sanctified and made holy permanently through the offering of the body of Jesus once for all. Right? And again, like, in the old, if you did a sin and then repented and forgave and paid for it, you were still righteous with God. You had access, but you weren't pure. It still was there because the law was still there. You're still thinking there. It could still happen. In the new, the sin is not believing in him. And you're not going to mess that one up next. You're going to keep on with that. So, though there are the bad things we stay away from, right? Your mind isn't going in this new covenant. 
oh man, I got to just not do this. Oh, I got to not do this. Oh, I got to not sin. What do I not got to do? What did I do wrong? What did I do? No, it's like, dude, that's what things that are unsanctified would have to concern themselves with. That's what they had to concern themselves back then. Back then. But now since Jesus did it, his one body for all ended the many different animal bodies for the different people back then. It's like, and in the new covenant, no sacrifices, new covenant, Jesus did it. It's like, it's just getting this idea across. And then if they would think that there's anything in the law, anything in the Old Testament that would do anything good for them, when they read this stuff, they're like, oh no, yeah, it wouldn't. It doesn't really. It's, it's, not, even, it's not even close to being good enough. It's even better now. It's a better covenant with better promises and I want it. Verse 11, and every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he's perfected forever those who are being sanctified, the ones who are sanctified, perfected forever. If God says that about you, if what Jesus did says that about you, that you are made this complete righteous self, then whatever tells you you're not, whatever keeps you away, whatever makes you think twice is a lie. Don't believe it. Reject it. Renounce it. Denounce it. That's what the devil wants because he knows when you know who you are and what you have and what Jesus made you to be, he has no chance because he is the enemy that's a footstool for the victorious Christ seated at the power of God, the son of man in victory who's given a kingdom that delivers the kingdom to the saints. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. For after, he said before, this is the covenant I will make with them after these days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I'll write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is remission of these... There's no longer an offering. If it's all gone once and for all totes, then you're not in any place to have to pay for it. Now, I'll still say this again. That's, these are covenant sins, right? They're still general sins. This other kind of just bad things we do that we stop doing that hurt us or hurt others. And, you know, that's a whole other thing here. But we're talking about relationship with God, who you really are, your heart from God's perspective, right? From us, we might still think, I'm weak, I'm less. And that's a problem because we renew our mind to think more like God because from God's perspective, you are clean. From God's perspective, what Jesus did works. From God's perspective, when he sees you, he sees Christ because what Christ did was for you, right? And if you try to lean into the old covenant stuff or try to follow these other stuff or the religion stuff or nationality stuff or these rules, then when God looks at you, you're trying to say, hey, God, look at me as if I was in Israel in the year 1100. Look at me as if I'm walking in the wilderness, you know, and I'm like, just trying not to eat a pig. I'm just not going to eat a pig. That'll make you happy, right? And it's like, that's not how God's looking at you now. And he didn't want to look at people that way. That's, that's why this new covenant is better promises. And it's for you and for me. And we are so blessed. Can you believe how blessed we are to live in this day? We'd be like, it'd be great to live in the day of Jesus. It would be. That would be cool, right? But they looked forward to our day. The biggest, baddest dude, we'll see this here, like these awesome guys, like they never got what they wanted. No one in Jesus' time got what, Jesus, what they really wanted and needed. The stuff Jesus promised that was coming, unless they lived, you know, past when Jesus died. The church came, the new covenant came, the Holy Spirit came. Then these people, the people who these books in the New Testament are being written to are the first generations of people who get to experience this new age of the fullness of Christ, this power of the spirit, this reality and this truth. These are the first ones who get it. So no wonder you're reading these things and they're talking about the power and how they love the spirit and how they're walking in this. And now you go to church on Sunday, no one even wants to pray in tongues somewhere. You're like, what's the difference? It's like they knew what it was like and they knew what's available. Now. We forgot what's available and we don't even like what is. Let me stand up, clap to a slow song, sway a little bit. Don't even know the words, don't even rhyme. Whoa, 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 whoa. I sit down. The pastor tells me a story I already heard before and preaches a salvation message and I've been saved for 40 years. 
And I start falling asleep. I wake up at the end in time for the offering, a nice long offering. And then I go home and eat and I fall asleep on the couch. Oh, what a great Sunday. Thank you for your rest, Lord. No, it shouldn't be like that. It's not supposed to be like that. Don't let it be like that. And it's up to you. And do your best. Go try to find a church that isn't like that or start your own or make a YouTube channel. If there's no longer an offering for sin, then either your sin is there or it's gone. And if Jesus came to die for your sin and there's no more offerings for it, then what sin are you talking about? Will I make mistakes? Yeah, we make mistakes. God said those aren't the sins that he counts for covenant. And you're being in covenant with him and being close allows you the chance and the opportunity to help yourself being free from those things and not hurting yourself and others. But the whole point is not to get you to stop doing bad. The whole point is for you to know him, hang out with him. Will you be his friend? You could say, well, you're my God. You're my Lord. I bow. He wants more than that. It's definitely a different kind of friendship. I mean, he's like a multi-dimensional, eternal being. We can't really exactly see, but you can hear, you can feel, you can talk. In fact, some of the most distracting ways people usually know people, God removed so that it can be heart to heart, soul to soul, and spirit to spirit, which is real value in relationship. Being known, that's what God wanted. And that's what he wanted for you. It's wild, like preaching the gospel to people who've been saved all their life. <laughs> but that's what it is. That's how good this stuff is. My goodness gracious. Mm, mm, mm. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God, let's draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let's consider one another in order to stir up judging and pointing out sin and being angry. No, no, no. Oh, I'm sorry. I read that wrong. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assemblings of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting, encouraging one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, why would he bring up about going to church? Because he's telling them, look at the Sabbath thing is done so. It's not synagogue time anymore. It's not Saturday time anymore. You're in this Sabbath rest, so it's not about a day. But get together with your homies and encourage each other on what? On sin? No, on love. Because why? Because we're supposed to be so confident in this hope and truth of what Jesus did that we boldly enter right in where the priests were like, oh, I don't know, man, I'm going to get like the ark is going to zap me or melt my face like in Raiders, right? No, boldness to enter. Why? Because the blood of Jesus, the real thing that happened. And by a new and living way, new, different than the old, right? Living, meaning happening, alive, not dead like the dead animals. He consecrated for us. He made the way pure for us. He made the way pure for you. It's not you making your way pure. He made it for you, for you. He consecrated it for us through the veil of his flesh, right? His body. He's doing all these comparisons, right? Like just metaphor, using poetic, beautiful, good speech. Having a high priest over the house of God, not just a temple thing. And we draw near with a true heart, with the full assurance of faith. Like it's like, can you imagine him writing this? It's almost like when, I, when I'm reading this now with this new covenant idea, it just like pumps me up. I'm like, oh, Oh my gosh, yeah, do it, man. Let me, let me, hopefully I can write like this someday, right? My goodness. And he's saying like, look at, so we hold this without wavering. Because if you don't, 
you will waver. So, for if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, then there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And some people would say this is like, look, he's being fearful and wrathful. Remember when he did this earlier in the book? After all he said, is this anything like this idea of if you sin, you lose your salvation? No, of course not. But what he's saying is like, look, when you see all this stuff, and if this old idea of sin with Moses and the law and all that stuff, vengeance is mine, God will judge, and all these bad things, but this new is different than that. But also when you see how good the new is, even looking back in that way, makes you not want to sin, and the sin is totally different anyway. Look, it's old. But recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, right? So he's talking to Christians, and he's encouraging them on this stuff and about their personal stuff, right? Just like the Corinthians, no doubt. Like, they had done some sins, and he's like, guys, get free from that. But recall the former days. After you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with suffering, partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me and my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. So he's like, remember before you learned this and then you're made a part to the stuff that, you know, and apparently this sounds like Paul, right? With his, he would bring up the stuff in the beatings and the prison and all the stuff that he had and that they would, they would share along with those who were persecuted and hurt and all the stuff. And they still gave. Because they knew they had a better thing in heaven. So he's like, don't throw away your confidence then. Because the confidence is a great reward. For you have need of endurance. So that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition. But of those who believe to the saving of the soul. We're not those who shrink back and perish, but ones who have faith and preserve their souls, is the other way of translating it. So, you know, if we just take this thing where he comes out and he's like, if you sin, will you just take that out of context without the whole idea, you're going to miss his point, which is, again, at the end, where we don't draw back. We're not going back into that sin. We're not going back into that, but we're believed to the saving of this and we receive the promise. And like, so... Wouldn't it be easy to take this top part right here, verse 26 on, and then put that with some Old Testament judgment verses and then really try to scare your Sunday morning friends in some scary thing and get them to run to the altar and get saved for the 5,000th time in their life? You could do that, but you're going to miss the whole point of everything. My goodness gracious. Ooh. And now we're going on to this idea. After all that harsh stuff, after all the strong stuff he said, now he's going on to this idea of what faith and the faith life is like, is really all about. So let's get up here to chapter 11. Ah, uh, we've arrived. Many of you people, this is, you got, you know, the most pages and markings on this part of your Bible. If you're a faith person, you know, it's like you need, they should make it where just the Hebrews 11 page of the Bible, you can like, make it on a little binder and you take that out and you could put in a new one because of how much you turn to it and stuff. But like we might see it a little bit freshly and differently in this new covenant idea though. Notice where we were just at, right? Just above. He's kind of yelling at him a little bit, talking about not shrinking back, keeping the endurance, receiving the promise. And then now he brings up this faith thing. So he's not, you know, the context is not faith for miracles, though, of course, we could learn things about it. The context is, is not um, some other, you know, faith for prophecy and everything. But 
we'll, we'll let him speak. Now, faith. Because remember, he just said about, like, after receiving the promise and things like that with believing. So now he says, so now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. So right there, what this verse is used for, we would say is more about a now New Testament power, faith type of thing. However, what we're saying is, is that he's saying that the faith and now faith, someone says, this is now faith. It's like, no, he's just, it's a word like, therefore this. Now faith is the substance of the things hoped for. It's that reality, and there's plenty of faith teachings about this idea, but knowing where we come from, he's saying that these things that are hoping for, faith is what it's made out of. The hoping is made out of faith. And the evidence of the things not seen is, as you're hoping, having faith in it, that is, what, from what he just was talking about, these promises that are coming, that's your connection to it. And then it says, for by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. So this is what, the, what he's about to go through. All these elders, these old people in scripture who just believed God, right? We're not talking about healing necessarily, though, of course, healing pops up. We're not just talking about supernatural miracles. We're not talking about any of that stuff. But it's about trusting and obeying and believing God. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Now that world words there also means ages. So that the ages and in here the worlds and the physical thing were made by God's word. So he said it, right? It's made by his word. So he said it and we see it for reality. And we're going to notice this thing because Remember the whole first part of this book, he's saying, here's old covenant stuff. Here's things God said was coming. And now you got to make this choice for what's here now versus what you've seen before. So he's saying this, that faith then is saying, God said something, God provided something, and the person had to accept and receive what God was doing. So you're hoping for this blessing from God that God said he would have? Well, faith is that, that thing to get it. And and what we'll see in all this stuff, and this is a little bit of a different perspective. It seems almost too simple when we look at some of these stories, because we look at all these things and we think of the big, awesome, amazing faith things of them. But notice what's the same thing in all of them, okay? And that, and that his point of this book is not a treatise on how to develop big Wigglesworth style faith, right? It's about the new covenant being different than the old. So that when God says something, we can trust it. So what does God say about the new covenant, about what Christ did, right? That's the biggest deal. And yes, we can take this and apply this to any other thing that we would have by faith. But the line, the thread that threads it all, that connects it all is trusting God above what we think we should have, above sin consciousness, above old stuff that doesn't count anymore, above the stuff that's faded away. No, we get what's now, it's true and a living, lively hope. So we go then by faith. Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was still righteous, that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and through it being dead, he still speaks. Some people use this, oh, his blood cries out, it's still, like he's still there. No, it's a metaphor, okay? It's not literally there speaking. And the idea was, is that he got the witness that he was righteous, that God said that you know, and we don't have scripture on this, right? That's the other thing. We wish we could like, where did God say that you could only sacrifice this and not this? For whatever reason, we don't know. We don't really have to. But that for whatever reason, that it showed something. And it's not that he would have guessed, right? That's not fair. That's not normal of God. If Nope, you guessed the wrong one. You should have sacrificed cauliflower, but you sacrificed a strawberry. Too bad, you're dead. No, like they would have heard something. They would have listened or trusted. There would have been something in the heart because it's about faith and it's about that he was still righteous, that he was still honoring that, right? So even though we don't have the whole story there, we don't have to get silly with it. Number five, verse five, by faith, Enoch was taken away so that he didn't see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, right? So we say, look, there's like, here's why Enoch did it. The Bible says it was he pleased God. 
So then he jumps in with saying, but look at without faith, it's impossible to please him because he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So he's saying, you know, because that's not the Bible. The Old Testament didn't say that Enoch, oh, he's just the most, you know, like, but he's saying that, look at he pleased God so much. So you Hebrew guys, you want to please God too? With faith, without faith, it's impossible to. Because for you to know God, you have to do what? Do all the right stuff, all that. No, know who he is and know what he does. Know that he's a rewarder of those who seek him. It's about the seeking, the relationship, the life. So we take this verse and we're kind of like, we apply it for all these other faith things. But what he's saying is, look at Enoch pleased God. He was a total dude of faith because how, how are you going to please God without faith? Because remember, he talked about the disobedience was the problem earlier in the book of Hebrews. So here he said, look, if you believe him, that's believing, obeying, not the unbelief and disobedience. So the faith, the believing is what he wants because you believe that God is and what he says he is and what he has to offer is true, which is in this book, the new covenant. By faith, Noah, verse seven, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. So the old covenant, the sacrifices, the old, the old thing, that was, could not see what was to come. They could not see what was coming. But now it's here to see, and then he gets that righteousness because he, you know, it's that, it's so good because you drop the righteousness is and the righteousness according to faith. This righteousness is this right standing with God where God says, yeah, you're my boy, you're my girl, you're righteous. That righteous, right? The righteousness according to faith. And his faith was believing that God said this thing was going to happen and here's my provision. And the new covenant, God's saying, look it, here's my provision. This is happening. Verse 8, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out of the place that, so that he could receive it as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. You see another comparison here? Leaving from the old covenant, Hebrews, leaving from that place where you were into this new place God's taking you. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise like a foreign country dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob. So remember this promised new covenant, like a foreign, totally different. These Hebrews would be like, okay, this new covenant is totally different, right? You see these? Dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of the same promise, for he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And that's a reference that is used a lot about this city, this continuing city. Um, oh, it's so good. By faith, Sarah herself, received strength to conceive seed and she bore a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Again, the promises of God for a new covenant. Boom, Sarah is using the same faith. So he's showing them through all the Old Testament, they would have never thought that all these people were actually being righteous by faith because they were trying to follow the rules or the laws or whatever. Of course, not Abraham and these other guys, but the ones later. Um, but that what really pleased God the most, even in and out of covenant in the old, was this faith thing. And here's how they did it. So he's telling them, you guys, you guys do this faith thing too. Because with the faith thing, you don't need the sacrifices. With the faith thing, you're not doing the old covenant. With the faith thing, your conscience isn't seared with sin. You're not worried. You're not in fear of death. You're not, you're not judged. With faith, you were judged for. Oh, it's so good. She bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man... And him as good as dead, dead, right? From one man as good as dead were born many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable, innumerable as the sand, which is by the seashore, which again, bringing many sons to glory. It's another reference and comparison to Jesus. These all, verse 13, died in faith, not having received the promises, not all of them, right? The ones that they experienced they did, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they'd come out, they would have had opportunity to return. Go back to where they came from, right? Go back to this old covenant thing, this home thing. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God's not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. 
Imagine these people who would be leaving, literally have to leave town, leave places because they were getting stoned and, and you know, they wouldn't be allowed in their synagogues and they were being persecuted. And they would have had to leave, like Jesus warning people, when Jerusalem gets attacked and stuff, escape to the city, escape to the mountains, you know, don't go down and get your thing from your house, just get out of there. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed will be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative case. And, and if you can see here as he's going, each of these things, he's reminding them about how Jesus is a, not that verse wasn't prophesying him, but these comparisons. So that they were like, oh, okay, Jesus, God is leaving these witness things and we see this, this thing at work. It's so good. And then the, in Isaac, your seed will be called and God would raise him up even from the dead. So like the seed, these people, the sons of this, the sons of Abraham's seed promise, those people at the time and me and you would receive this promise. It's like, it's just all like, it, it's showing how what faith is doing is seeing that the same God who did that did so many similar and better things through Jesus and we're invited to enter in just like these awesome people they did. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning the things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not, and they were not afraid of the king's command. You remember anybody else who was like a little baby and was hidden? By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. This is Jesus' references, right? Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater than the riches of the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. And of course, Christ wasn't there, but he's just literally inviting you into the metaphor. That like, so these same promises, like he didn't mind the approach of doing good, the reproach, the attacks, the negativeness of it. It's the same way Christ did it for you. And you don't then either because of him. It's, it's so good. By faith, he forsook Egypt. He left where he was from, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible, following by faith God, taking you from the place you were into this new place of faith. By faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch him. And again, those were these commands of God. And we know that Passover, when Jesus died, and the blood, Jesus' blood. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as on dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. The ones who came over looking for God's promise were saved, and the ones who didn't, who couldn't get it, who weren't going for that, perished. Old covenant, new covenant. It's so beautiful. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. Why? Because Jesus said so. By faith, or God says so, don't do it. By faith, the harlot Rahab didn't perish with those who didn't believe when she received the spies with peace. And what more shall I say? Time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and also David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised again to life. My goodness gracious. Like, in each of those, subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, quenched violence of fire, escaped the sword. All these have New Testament biblical references and they're things that we would be able to extrapolate into our day of the life of faith. Oh, it's so good. Even down to the dead being raised to life back then and now. And then, <laughs> Jesus' time. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. These are like a lot of things that happened to the prophets and stuff. 
They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, all those didn't receive the promise yet. But God has provided something better for us that they wouldn't be made perfect apart from us. All those who came before, all their faith, all their sacrifices, all their victories, all the difficulties, it becomes full because the promise becomes full in us and it becomes real. It becomes alive. You get to see what it's supposed to be. They were these seeds and we're this grown part of it. And that their completion is shown when you and I do this race of faith. And here's the next verse, chapter 12. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Now let's stop there a second. Some people read this and they go, hey, look at the word cloud is in the sky and heaven is in the clouds. And these people, if they died, are in heaven. So then they must be the cloud of witnesses. So then other people and witnesses is somebody who is viewing something. So this must mean that these people then and this must mean that these people then and people now are witnessing us in the cloud and they're watching. If that's true or not, that's not what this verse is saying. He just went through a bunch of these witnesses and he's using a word. Therefore, since we are surrounded with all those witnesses, all those stories we just had, all of those people we're surrounded by, they're incomplete without us. So we're surrounded by all of those stories. Since we're surrounded by their stories that were just mentioned and not literally surrounded and they're not literally a cloud, right? You get this? Because that is our history, because that is our, our foundation, because that's what we're made of. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Remember, they couldn't get the promise. They couldn't get the finish. We have the finish. They had the author. They didn't have the finish. We have the author and the finish. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. All these stories bringing you into these faithful people who did great and you're listening and they were listening and being like, yes, yes, they did it. It was by faith. They did trust God. And he said, so because of all that, you can do the same. And you lay aside whatever is going to stop you from it, whatever sin, whatever issue, whatever thing. Drop all that and go and fight and go for it like them because you not only can be like them with faith because God made it happen, but because Jesus started it and he finished it and you're the finish. What they looked forward to is what you have. What they needed, you got. What they prayed and asked for, God has delivered unto you and you and them together make this hugely amazing, glorious story of God's salvation and his promises and his reality for the earth to come and the earth today. That's why we're his testimonies. That's why we would be witnesses. Not just seeing something, obviously. Mm. But being something. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged yourself. Like, it's like look at, look at what Jesus took. And he was nothing but good. So don't you get worried and discouraged when you go through this stuff. You've not yet resisted to bloodshed when you're striving against sin. You haven't died from blood like when you're like just, you know, like trying to be good. You're, you're not getting what he had. And you've forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, don't despise the chastening of the Lord. Neither be discouraged when you're rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there who a father doesn't chasten? But if you're without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you're illegitimate and not sons. He's like, you're probably going to go through some stuff. God's working this thing out. Furthermore, we've had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shouldn't we much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? Showing him respect for that? For indeed, for a few days chastened us, they indeed, our fathers, chastened us as seemed best to them. 
but God does it for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Now, again, remember, he's talking to these people who are going through stuff, not only persecution, and, and you see the stuff that he's referencing, like them having to leave home, leave places, leave their lives, which is the Christian life back then. It, it's a lot harder in America now. In other countries, you lose your family and everything if you become a Christian. In America, people just stopped inviting you fun places or whatever. I don't know. But these people going through these persecutions, going through these things, because their question would be, well, if I have all this freedom, I have this faith, I know God, then what is some of this difficulty? Can't I be without difficulty? He's like, dude, if God is just purifying you and your stuff, then receive that. Receive that and go for it. Keep going. Pick yourself up and keep on going with it. Because any father who doesn't try to set you on the right place isn't a good father. And he's a good father. Hmm. Chastening seems, none of it seems joyful for the present, but afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness, the fruit, the result of being right and connected with God by those who've been trained by it in that process. Oh my goodness. 12. So he's like, so he's like, guys, okay, toughness. But 12, therefore strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight pads for your feet, so that what's lame may not be dislocated, but be healed. He's like, pick your chin up, guys. Look at it. Just keep it, keep it on the right path so everything can get healed. 14, pursue peace with all people and holiness, which without, without which no one will see the Lord. And there, of course, he's quoting um, in some, what is he quoting? Well, the Old Testament thing, here he mentions Matthew. Like, and so notice that since he's telling them pursue peace with all people and stuff that and referencing the chastening and the stuff that these people are living this life, the early Christian life, which was being targeted, which was being persecuted, all this stuff. So he's giving him encouragement and saying, look at on your side, pursue peace and this holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. And by this, many become defiled lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Now you might have heard some people say some of this, kind of connecting it with, maybe you lose your salvation if you do this thing. Look at, if someone stops believing and they get so trapped up in the sin and everything, they stop believing and they exit the covenant, yeah. But, what he's doing, you can see clearly here, is that he's warning them, hey, look at, even in the other people do you bad, you do the good, you pursue peace, and then don't fall into the traps of defending, right? Of letting a root of bitterness come up, you know, or any of the thing that's trading what you actually already have, all the way down to the profane flesh, like he wanted food, so he, he traded what was the awesome, beautiful, spiritual, real thing, this inheritance, for some passing thing. So he's saying like, don't in your response in this stuff, do that. If you have this awesome place, this awesome thing God gave you, don't step out of that place to address somebody who's just speaking evil, who's just doing evil. It's not your place. Like, don't go down to there. Don't let it bring you down, right? For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and burned with fire and to blackness and darkest and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the words shouldn't be spoken to them anymore. For they couldn't endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I'm exceedingly afraid and trembling. Do you remember this scenario? At Sinai, the old covenant. He's saying, with this whole thing, you haven't come to that mountain where it's like, oh my gosh, it's so burned and scary. And that like, if you even touch it, you're going to die, all this stuff. And that even Moses was scared of it. He's like, that's not your world. That's not the covenant you've been to. But what covenant are you in? This new covenant? What you say is, you've come to Mount Zion and the city of the living God. Not earthly Jerusalem, what? Heavenly Jerusalem, right? Earthly Jerusalem is where the earthly priests were. Heavenly Jerusalem where Jesus is, is overall. And again, it's a metaphor, not a real thing. Not being literal here, right? 
It's a comparison from Mount Sinai to Mount Zion, which was God's mountain. To not the where the animals would die, but where God was living, the living God. Not to just the earth priest people, but to the heavenly Jerusalem, the eternal real one. To an innumerable company of angels, not just the ones who mediated, right? To the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. So not just to these 70 elders and these people, but to the general assembly and church of Jesus Christ, who's registered in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men who were made perfect. Not the one point, not the one where the sin is the point out and the focus, but the judge of the, to the spirits of the just men, the righteous people who've been made perfect in him and complete. To Jesus, the mediator of this new covenant, not that old one, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better than the one of Abel. All the good stuff in the old is even better in the new. And all the bad stuff in the old didn't get brought in. And when bad stuff does show up, like sin, like problems, like our weaknesses, there's a solution to be able to get rid of it. And if other people do it, to forgive and to be strong. It's kind of an awesome plan, only if people knew about it. Verse 25. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. God, Jesus, this new covenant, this whole idea, right? He's getting to the end. Romans chapter 13, this the last chapter. This is his whole story, right? For if they didn't escape who refused him who spoke on earth, how much more will we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven? So he's like, guys, listen to this new covenant thing. This is the thing. Because if God did with the old and didn't do it, then what do you think is going to happen if you reject the new? Whose voice shook the earth, but now he's promising, yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken. As if things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Mm, this everlasting, unshakable righteousness. My goodness. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, here he's connecting the kingdom with this new covenant, with this relationship, with this righteousness. Do you see this? Since we are receiving a kingdom which can't be shaken, let us have grace. Grace, faith, right? How we get it? Notice this. Like, since we have that with grace, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptab acceptably. By which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Now, notice this. What's the idea? Oh, look out. You're going to burn if you don't get it. No, he's saying, look it. We know how serious God is. We know this fire thing. We know how this was in the old. And if he was that serious for these things which are less than, which bring, you know, sin consciousness, he is this much more sure and positive and solid and trustworthy and fiery and, and consumed with this new covenant he's providing. That says godly fear. It's saying believing him, trusting him, not being afraid of him in that sense, saying, look it, I'm going to accept this new covenant, this new covenant reality with as much gusto and as much focus and desire as I did the old covenant. But it's not a fear then of punishment. It's a fear of not being free because I'm still holding on to something. Now, here's this last chapter. And you know, in these epistles, um, there's kind of some general little things that are said here and there. Most likely, a lot of people would have asked questions and he might be answering them or he's just thinking of some one-liners that don't necessarily mean everything with all, but he'll probably tie it in a little bit later. Um, but in the end, as it says here, concluding moral directions, usually at the end, there'll be just some good encouraging stuff. It's just how they wrote letters back then. And, um, you know, it's great. It's great stuff, but we can sort of see he kind of got to the, the crescendo of his argument, right? 13. Let brotherly love continue. Don't forget to entertain strangers, for by doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Angels unaware. Remember the prisoners as if you were chained by them, and those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the same body. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. 
For he himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? See, just like good encouragement stuff. My gosh, you could preach on any one of those. And usually most people do. Seven, remember those who rule over you, who've spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So don't be carried about with various and strange doctrines. For it's good that the heart be established by grace, not with the foods which haven't profited those who've been occupied with them. So here we see they're saying, remember the teachers and the rulers and, you know, that when they say and do things, things happen, so do it yourself. And then that Jesus is the same in what he did through all this thing. So if you hear these new doctrines or whatever that are saying Jesus did something else that are adding to it or whatever, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it's good to have the heart be established with grace, not about foods, right? And this is kind of addressing the old covenant dietary laws of eating and what you eat and stuff like that. But just grace and care is better because, you know, if your heart is messed around with the being preoccupied with that, then it hasn't profited them, is his point. Continuing about the food, we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside of the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside of the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside of the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, this the idea from earlier, that we seek the one to come. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But don't forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. So here, you know, bring in with the food and then saying that we have this altar and the people who used to serve the tabernacle couldn't eat. They couldn't eat the foods. The food was for God. The bread was for God, whatever. And, but, um, and some of the animals they would sacrifice and leave out. Other ones they could eat is when, if animals were given to them. But he's making another comparison that, look, Jesus got taken out to be sacrificed. So we'll go out of the city with him. It's like another thing of just, we're not doing this old covenant thing. It's very different. And that here we don't have this. It's not about this location. It's not about Jerusalem. It's not about this thing. It's this one to come. And in this idea of it being one to come is the one that was being made in them. You know, when the comparison was this physical place, to this non-physical one. Um, and then it, in mentioning the sacrifices, he goes, so we'll give our sacrifice, but it's not going to be like the animals. We're going to sacrifice with our words and praise and just give. So again, we have the song, we bring the sacrifice of praise, right? But it's just a metaphor saying, in, like those people in the old did these sacrifices with animals. We will give God our words and thank him and love him. You know what I mean? Again, just making sure we take the word sacrifice and not make that a religious thing when it's a metaphor. And then don't forget to do good and share for with these sacrifices, God's well pleased. Again, same thing. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Verse 18, pray for us that we're confident that we have a good conscience in all things desiring to live honorably. But I especially urge you to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, Make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And those there attaching some of these same things, this idea of the shepherd and the sheep and the blood and the covenant, like touching all those same things, but saying that it's Jesus and to him be the glory forever. And I appeal to you, brothers, bear with the word of exhortation. For I've written to you in a few words. He's like, get with this. You know, that was a few words, right? You know, Paul, he would, if it was Paul, he would talk all night and people fall out the window, falling asleep, right? 
Know that our brother Timothy has been set free, with whom I shall see you if he comes shortly. And that, of course, is one of the references of why people would think this might be Paul, because he hung out with Timothy and Luke, and they were all homies. Greet all those who rule over you and all the saints. Those from Italy greet you. Grace be with you all. Amen. Hmm. Amen. Amen. Hmm. So good. Thank you so much for being here with me. If you made it all the way to the end, drop a number 17 in the messages for the eternal life that you have. John 17, 3. This is life eternal, to know the Father and the Son whom he has sent. It can only happen in this new covenant we have. And all the things that we see here that God inspired the writer of Hebrews to tell and show to them about how Jesus is better, how the covenant is better, how it's a higher way, how the other stuff just made you think of sin, but the new one makes you think of righteousness, everything we've seen here today. I hope you will let it just fill you up, drip down into your soul, and then recognize and know all of these things that God wanted so much closeness and no separation. That he did everything it could, including Jesus Christ dying, so that you could have what all the people in the Bible wish they could have before Jesus. And what all the people being written to this letter were the first to be the ones experiencing. This new covenant, kingdom lifestyle, filled with the power of the Spirit, knowing God, connecting with him, being able to relate to him, being able to go to him boldly, because you know it's all about the grace he has for you and all about the love and for your problems, your desires, your wishes, your hopes that he wants to walk through life with you hand in hand, moment by moment, and that you can have that standing with him where it's possible because of what Jesus did. And it wasn't because you and I begged for it or they begged for it. It wasn't because we're so bad. It's because God's so good and that's what he wanted. This new covenant thing, man, it glorifies Jesus so much. It shows how God really is. That even the covenant he was faithful to, that Israel was unfaithful to, he was not a dishonest cheater who would just destroy it or rip it up because in it were promises that God wanted to give. And even when mankind couldn't fulfill it, Jesus came as a man, stripping itself, not considering his divinity as something to hold on to, but came as a man, tempted as we are to do it, so that he could live and die, fulfilling it for us, so that we could have the life God always wanted, but we could never get to, because you can't earn it, because you can't, and because the sin mind and the problems and the errors only distract you from where God wants you to be. Because where he wants you to be is thinking of nothing more than a loving, open, connected relationship with him, just like he thinks about you. Do you know that? Do you know that how we think about him and how we separate ourselves from him, he doesn't think the same way? He wouldn't view one who's caught in trouble or caught in, you know, in sin or problems. He's not viewing, you're bad, you're separate. He's saying, with love I come to you, with open arms. Wanting for you to be free from any of the negative emotions that you're in and wanting you to experience all the love and joy that I have. And even if it's this momentary time now where that's even possible, whatever's next, you can have a foretaste of that. That's why. That God wasn't expecting you to have to experience heaven after you die, but now. That's why the covenant, the spirit, the freedom, the glory, the joy, the kingdom is all now and from now on. And when you step from this kingdom with here into heaven for whatever's next, you're going from this glory to glory thing, just like going from the good glory of the old covenant to the glory of the new. And it's this upward step. And when you know this and have this and know his heart and you experience it, then the little problems, the little trials, or the big problems and the big trials mean nothing. Because when the light of the glorious sun shines in your eyes, nothing else, you can't see anything else. And the light of Christ can shine for you in that way. And I hope. I hope it does. 
I love you and the Lord loves you. We'll see you next time.